take a look in your bulletin and you'll see the passage on which the teaching is based. What we're going to do starting tonight is begin a series looking at the life of Abraham. In other words, going back to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is a... Hmm. The book of Genesis we looked at earlier in the year, looking at the first 11 chapters. Now we're going to pick up and look at the life of Abraham for the next four, uh, five or six weeks. Let me read you the passage. Oh, wait a minute. Michelle, doesn't she do it? Oh, well, I preempted Michelle, I think. Let me read it. <clears throat> Genesis 11, 27 to 12, 9. This is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarah was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. And the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I will bless those... Yeah. <clears throat> so Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give you this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Okay, this is God's word. Abram, pretty important person. When, I, uh, there's a, when we drive to a place that our family tends to shop in Queens. We drive on as, through Astoria on 36th Avenue. We pass two mosques, two synagogues, several churches. And you know that every one of them are filled with people who consider themselves children of Abraham? You know there's three major world faiths, majority of the population of the world, that look to Abraham as their father in the faith? Do you think you'd ever be able to understand world civilization if you don't understand this man's story? But more existentially, <laughs> the more practically, when you read the story of Abraham, you'll see something very attractive. Abraham, by the way, right now his word is Abram. Later on his name will be Abraham. Don't let that throw you. Abram means father. Abraham means father of many. So Abram means daddy. Abraham means big daddy. I mean, it's, and it sounds so much alike, I don't think you have to worry about it. But... Abraham didn't live life, uh, how do I say, he didn't just live life. Life didn't just happen to him. Uh, he didn't just go with the flow of events. He happened to life, see. He lived a big life. He, in, he stu- you can even see it right in the text that we've already read. He stood against his family, he stood against his society, he stood against his culture. You know, monotheism is kind of taken for granted by most people today. But back then, it wasn't taken for granted. He stood alone. Now, where do you get that kind of greatness? Hmm? He lived a big life. Today, we might call him a man of vision. But that's not it. What made Abram great was the call of God. 
And the point I'd like to make to you tonight is that what makes your life special, distinctive, is the call of God. The call of God is what makes you a Christian to start with. You're not a Christian unless you've heard and embraced the call. And the call of God is what shapes your life distinctively. It's what makes your life a Christian life, is that you're answering, you're hearing, you're embracing the call. So what the text tells us are three things about the call of God, okay? The power of it, the radical nature of it, and how we can receive it. The power of it, the radical nature of it, how we can receive it. And the first part tells us about the power, the second part of the passage tells us about the nature of it, and the third part about how to receive it. Look, first, the power of it. I must admit that whenever I've preached on the call of Abraham, I've always started with chapter 12. Why did we read these few few verses at the end of chapter 11? And the reason is, I overlooked them in the past, they're telling us something amazing. They're telling us that all human history has come to a dead end. You see, if you, you, I don't know how many of you can remember, but Genesis 1 to 11 is a story of a spiraling down of the human race. The human race is getting more and more corrupt, more and more evil, more and more violent, more and more oppressed, more and more broken, and, there's, and it, it looks bad, but there's in chapters 1 to 11, there's one ray of hope. And that one ray of hope is a single family tree, a single line. You might remember that in the midst of all the violence, there was one family, the family of Seth. Seth, we're told in Genesis 4, called upon the name of the Lord, which is a Hebrewism for talking about worship of God. And Seth, in Seth's family alone, the knowledge of the true God was preserved. And it was passed on. And chapter 11, verse 27 This is the account of Terah, brings us through, because Terah and Abram, his son, is the end of the line, and it is the end of the line, because these verses tell us something disastrous. First of all, the word Terah means moon. Ur of the Chaldees was a center of lunar worship. And the the true family, the family that was supposed to be preserving, the last family, The last family knowing who God is and knowing who created the world. Think about this. And knowing what we were built for. The last family who knew anything about God has gone over to idol worship. And if you're wondering about that, it's it's confirmed in Joshua. At the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua gets the people of Israel together and he says this in chapter 24. He says, long ago your forefathers, even Terah, Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But the Lord took your father Abraham out of the land beyond the river. Do you realize what's happened? Spiritually, the last little candle has just flickered out. The last place that anybody knows about God is right there. And spiritually, the last family that knew anything about God has just lost it. And it's not just true spiritually, but physically. Sarah is barren. And what does that mean? It means not only is the last family that knew anything about God, not only has it lost God spiritually, but it's about to literally end physically. There's not going to be any more family. That's why Walter Brueggemann, uh, is a commentator on, wrote a good commentary on the book of Genesis, puts it like this. He says, the barrenness of Sarah is an effective metaphor for hopelessness. Listen, this text tells us there is no foreseeable future There is no human power to invent a future. The human race and human history has just hit a dead end. It's over. And then God speaks, and there's hope again. Now, what's the first principle? The first principle is we're being shown the power of the call. Let me get this down to earth. The power of the call means this. The call of God is absolutely necessary and absolutely gracious. Let me show you. First of all, it's absolutely necessary. Abram was in the best family, the best family on the earth. But if it wasn't for the call of God, he was spiritually dead. Now, let me, let me be real, let me put a, let me be vivid about this. I have three sons. They were raised here. They were raised in Redeemer, 
which I think is a good church. They were raised in our home, where my wife and I did everything we possibly could to put Christianity before them in an attractive way and explain it to them, all right? But I want you to know something. Unless every one of them hear the call of God personally to them, unless the call of God comes in, disturbs them, convicts them, humbles them, shakes them up, unless the call of God comes to them and they embrace them, they're just going to be nice little idolaters like Abram. See, it doesn't matter how good your family is. Everybody tends to take something created, the moon. But here, my children are going to be nice because we're nice. They're going to be moral probably because we're moral. They're going to maybe even be religious. But they're going to be idolaters. They're going to live for their career. They're going to live for their, for their family. They're going to live for something else unless the call of God comes into their life. Now, by the way, I, I've got to do something. I'm not, I'm not concerned about my children spiritually. I don't want anybody to think. I'm not trying to get at them. You don't have to send them this tape. You know, all right? I'm very happy with their spiritual progress, but their progress is a result of the call. If they're making any spiritual progress, it's because of the call. It doesn't matter your family. See, in Genesis 1 to 11, the family of Cain, the line of Cain, the bad people, the wicked people, the line of Seth, the good people, it doesn't matter. <laughs> You're in spiritual death sleep without the call. It is an absolute necessity. It's got to come in. It's got to disturb you. It's got to, it's, it's got to disrupt you. And secondly, it's absolutely gracious. The power of the call is not just seen in that it's absolutely necessary, but also that it's absolutely gracious. Abram is unqualified. Abram is not a good guy. Abram is not a faithful man. The call comes to Abram because he's unqualified. Or let me put it this way. The call of God is an absolute act of grace. It doesn't come because you're qualified. You're qualified because it's come. It qualifies you. In other words, if I, if I want to hire a computer programmer and I'll call you up if you're a computer programmer, why? I will only call you if you're qualified. My, it's a human call can't give you the qualifications, but God's call does. Uh, the 1964 movie, Beckett. Do you remember that movie? What a movie. Peter O'Toole plays Henry II. Richard Burton played Thomas Beckett. Based on the true story, uh, Henry and Thomas Beckett were drinking buddies. It's Henry II. This is the, uh, you know, 12th century A.D. They were drinking buddies, and what's interesting is that at Thomas was cleric. He was a clergy. I mean, he was a minister. But he was, just like the king, corrupt, you see, hot-headed, you know, sent, living for sensuality. They were just hot-headed, good old boy drinking buddies. And then, one day, the Archbishop of Canterbury died, and Henry II had a brainstorm. I'll make Thomas the Archbishop of Canterbury. Wow! What a brainstorm. Why? Because Thomas is just like a regular guy. He's not going to be telling me how I've got to live my life. He's not going to be telling me not to oppress the poor. He's not going to be telling me, you know, uh, you know, to stop whoring around. He's not going to do any of that stuff. He's just a regular guy. This is great. Finally, we solved the problem of church-state relations. And so he makes Richard Burton, Peter O'Toole makes Richard Burton, he makes Thomas Beckett, Archbishop of Canterbury, and then something happens. Thomas is shaken because he knows that even though it's come through Henry for all the wrong reasons, and even though he's completely corrupt and completely unholy and completely unworthy and completely unqualified, he is now the Bishop of England. And he suddenly realizes a sense in his heart of the call of God. He realizes the grace of it. He realizes how unworthy he is of it, and it changes him, and he becomes a good person, and he becomes a man of integrity, and he begins to represent the gospel, he begins to represent Christ, he begins to represent the word, and he begins to call Henry for the things that he's doing wrong, and Henry's going nuts. And finally, if you remember how the story goes, Henry is just all filled with conflict, you know, because he, he loves Thomas, and yet now he's so mad at Thomas because Thomas has become a good guy. Thomas is telling him the truth. And finally, one night, I think he's drunk, actually, but he's also conflicted, and he's just, he's just so upset about what's happened, and Henry II cries out to his knights, who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? 
You know, he doesn't have the guts to come right out and say it. But the four knights look at each other and they go, and they go to the cathedral and they murder Thomas Beckett right there. 1170 AD, it really happened. But in the movie, as Richard Burton sees the knights of Henry killing him, he's laying there, and what are his last words? Do you remember? Do you remember? He says, poor Henry. The call had made him holy. The call had made him like Christ. He was completely unworthy. He was just as corrupt as anybody else, but the call had come into his life, and now he's like Jesus. Father, forgive Henry. He really doesn't know what he's doing. The call of God is so powerful that not only do you have to have it or your life is a dead end, I don't care how nice a person you are, but it also will transform you, I don't care how bad a person you are. The call of God, the power of the call, dead end, barrenness, right? But in comes the call and there's hope again. So the first thing we learn is the power of the call. The second thing we learn is the radical nature of the call. See, a lot of you are saying, okay, okay, it's powerful, but what is it? What is it a call to do? What, what is the content of the call? And that is what we see in the famous place, chapter, one, uh, chapter 12, verses one, uh, 1 to 3, where it says, get out of your country, your people and your father's household, go to the land I will show you, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, let me show you how radical this call is. What is this call? Number one, it's personally radical. When he says, leave your country, that's the NIV translation, but the old translation is right. The old King James is right when it translates it like this, get the out, because there's two Hebrew words there, not one. Literally, God says, go yourself out. Get yourself out. Get out yourself. And you know why? Look at the little word but in verse 31. It says that Terah, see the whole group, Terah and Nahor and the children of Haran and Abram, they had all set out for Canaan, right? See, it says in verse 31, together they set out from Ur, the Chaldeans, to go to Canaan, but they stopped at Haran. Why? They didn't want to go any further. That was it. They had been called to go to Canaan, but they stopped in Haran. And that's the reason why God doesn't just say, leave your country. He doesn't just say, get out. He says, get yourself out. This is what he's saying. Abram basically is having a conversation, and he's saying, well, you know, God, I've come halfway. This is as far as Dad and everybody else wants to go. You know, Nahor and all the guys, they, you know, I just can't get them. They, they like it here, you know, and they, they don't want to go any further. I've come halfway. And so what is God saying? Then come yourself. He is saying this. It's not good enough to be part of a Christian ethos. It's not good enough for you to say, well, I'm in a Christian family and I've always liked joining a church. Or I'm, I'm from Scotland and I feel at home in a Presbyterian church. Or I'm Italian and I feel at home in a Roman Catholic church. Or I'm Mississippian and I'm at home in a Southern Baptist church. It's not enough to be part of the ethos. It's not enough just to be part of the environment. And yes, of course, I, I, I feel very good around Christians and I like to... Have you met God yourself? Have you gotten out yourself? Have you encountered him yourself, in your own self? Has it penetrated you as an individual? Have you made the personal commitment? Do you see that? That's the first thing. It's personally radical. You can't come in on anybody else's coattails. It's got to be your faith, number one. But number two, ooh, and this is the part you're going to hate, okay? Just let you know. It's volitionally radical. Why do I use the word volition? Because at the heart... The call of God is the surrender of the will. And the place, the place where you see that is where this first sentence is left open-ended. Get out of your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land that I will show you. Now, this is terrible. He doesn't say go to the land, latitude, <laughs> longitude, 
25 more miles on the interstate, third exit, turn right. He just says, get out, but I'm not going to tell you where you're going to go. Now, here's how we are. People are saying to me all the time, I'm interested in being a Christian, but, will I have to break up with my boyfriend or my girlfriend? Will, will I be able to still live the material lifestyle I've got right now? Will I have to stop this? Will I have to stop this? Will I have to start this? Will I have to start this? And you know what? When I was a younger minister, uh, which was a long time ago, <laughs> I made the mistake of trying to answer those questions. I used to say, well, yeah, Christians can do this, and they can do this, but they can't do this, and they can't do this. And I began to realize how deadly wrong I was. Because when you say, I'll get out if you'll show me where you're taking me, if you'll show me exactly what you want me to do, and exactly where you're going to have me go, you're not answering the call. You're staying in control of your own life. You're not giving up your volition. You're not giving up your will. You're not surrendering your will. You're staying on the throne, as it were. You're staying behind the driver's seat. You're staying in the driver's seat. What you're really saying is, I'll be happy to go if I know where you're going and it makes sense to me. But God actually says to Abram, get out. And Abram says, where? And God says, I'll show you later, just go. And later he's going to say, I'll give you a son. And Abram says, how? And God says, I'll show you later, just trust. And finally he says, go to the top of the mountain and put your son to death. And Abram says, why? And God says, I'll show you later. Just climb. And that's Christianity. Uh, my wife and I have a public service announcement to make. She's been after me to say this somehow, and I'm very happy to work it in this week. Over the years, we have people constantly say, well, I, you know, I always hear you make references to Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. So we started it, and we just could, it just got bogged down. I just couldn't get into it. And I say, where did you start? And usually people say, we started with the book The Hobbit. And I always say, we, Kathy and I always say, that was your mistake. The Hobbit is a children's book, and then comes the three books of the trilogy, The Lord of the Rings. And I was listening to a literary critic who knows these books and says, the thing you've got to keep in mind is The Hobbit is an adventure, but The Lord of the Rings is a quest. The Hobbit book is a book for children, and it's, a, it's more lighthearted, and it's an adventure. And the way the literary critic defines adventure is he says, an adventure is a there and back again. It's an exciting thing that you choose. And you go and you have your adventures and you, you, you have all your thrills and it spices up your life and then you come home again and you pick your life up again where it, where it left off. An adventure is there and back again. But a quest is not something you choose, it comes to you. You sense a requirement. You're called to it because of what's involved. And you never really come back from a quest. In a quest, you either die for the quest, or if you do come back, you're so changed that you never, in a sense, come back. You never, you're never the way you were. You change so radically. Now, I want you to know, Christianity is not an adventure. I mean, obviously, I'm using the term technically, because in another way, in a more general way, you can use the word adventure and it be valid. But as I'm using the words right now, Christianity is not an adventure. It's not there and back again. It's not like, I want to have some fun. I want to enrich my life. Christianity is a quest. God says, get out. You're going to be radically changed. Don't ask me whether or not what I'm about to do will fit into your agenda. Christianity is a whole new agenda. Don't say, how is this going to enrich my life? Christianity is a whole new life. What does it mean to answer the call? It's to get out, not knowing where you're going. That's what Hebrews 11:8 says. Hebrews 11:8 summarizes Genesis 12 like this. God said to Abram, get out. And so he went out, not knowing whither he went, not knowing where he was going. And if, unless you say to the Lord, whatever I discern as your will, I will do unconditionally from here on in. You're not a Christian. You haven't answered the call. It's not, it's, you're not a Christian to say, I will obey if. I will obey if it looks like it fits in. You're not a Christian until you've taken your hands off your life 
It's volitionally radical. Thirdly, it's missionally radical. Now, why do I use the word missionally? Well, look at the third part. It's personally radical, you've got to meet him yourself. It's volitionally radical, you've got to surrender your will, take your hands off your life. But it's missionally radical. Look at this. I will bless you. Ah, but why? That you may be a blessing. Because through you, all the families and peoples of the earth will be blessed. To become a Christian is to be changed so that now you are not making your decisions on the basis of what is the most comfortable for me, where do I live that's most comfortable, what job do I take that's the best for my, um, uh, you know, for, for my safety and my comfort and my influence and my status. You don't make your decisions like that anymore. The call of God reshapes you, so you're asking yourself the question, where can I most be a blessing? See, the call of God goes like this. If you seek to be blessed, you'll be empty. If you seek to bless others, I'll bless you. If you live for the blessing of others, if you live to fill others up, I'll fill you, says God. I will bless you that you may be a blessing. God only blesses that you may be a blessing. And you say, well, then how can I be a blessing? The answer is you've got to get out. Get out, and I will bless you that you may be a blessing. Let me show you how that works. What does it mean to get out of your country? What does it mean to get out of your family? What does it mean? It means to get out of your security zone. Get out of your comfort zone. It means to get out of the familiar. And here's what I, here, let me show you how this works. Let me give you a case study. I'm constantly running into people, Christians, when I go around the country who say, why in the world would you raise your family in New York City? What a terrible place. It's financially uncomfortable. It's physically uncomfortable. <laughs> this, is, this is living in New York. It is, you know, subway, even your apartment, you know. You know. <laughs> then they're getting across. It's physically uncomfortable. It's financially uncomfortable. Everything is more complicated. But here's an interesting thing. Uh, I've been here 12 years now, and therefore, uh, you certainly know, I'll say it once, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Not everybody's called to live in New York. Not everybody's called to stay in New York. I mean, you may get called to another place where you can use your gifts better than here, and that's where you need to go. But one thing I've always noticed is when I meet somebody who lived in New York and came to Redeemer, say, for two years or three years or five years or six years, and now they're somewhere else, I have yet to talk to somebody who didn't say this. New York was the least comfortable place I've ever lived, and it was the most useful place I've ever felt I was useful. In other words, it was the place where I was, I felt the most useful, but it was the place where I was the most uncomfortable. Where we are now is much, more uncomf is much more comfortable. We have a nice big house. We feel more safe. We're surrounded by people who are just like we are. We don't have the issues that, that you know, face you every day in New York. And we don't feel anywhere near as much as we're on the front lines or as we're useful in the other lives of other people. Well, it shouldn't surprise you. This is what God says. God says, if you're willing to get out, I'll make you a blessing. If you want to stay in safety, if you want to, stay, if you want to keep a tidy, manageable, comfortable little life, you're not going to be of much use to anybody. I mean, that's in the macro and the micro. Right now, in your life, there are people around you that need for you to tell them the truth about something, and you're scared. You won't do it. You know why? You don't want to get out of your safety zone. <laughs> you don't want to be criticized. You don't want to look bad. You, you don't want, you don't want to uh, risk looking bad or risk uh, putting your, making yourself vulnerable to criticism, right? You don't want to do that. As a result, you're not able to bless them. Here's how it works. The call of God works like this. To the degree you're willing to get out, get out of the familiar, get out of the safe, get out of the comfortable, to that degree God says, I will bless you in order that you may be a blessing. I'll appear to you. I'll come into your life. So the call of God is personally radical. Secondly, it's volitionally radical. Thirdly, it's missionally radical. I ought to say one more thing because I put a quote in the front about this, but I'll just, uh, I'll be real brief about this. The call of God is culturally radical. And boy, I tell you, when people tell me that the gospel gives you pat answers, I just know they don't know what they're talking about. I'm sorry, that, that sounds disrespectful, but I have to say it. Abraham left, but never arrived. You know that? I know it says he arrived at Canaan, but here's the whole point of the, of the story of Abram. 
He is told, leave your people and leave your nation and leave your culture and go to another land where I will make you to be a nation, make you to be a new culture. But Abraham himself never actually gets it. He never sees it, right? He lives his entire life in a huge gap between promise and reality. And that's very uncomfortable. It would have been more comfortable if he'd stayed in Ur. It'd be more comfortable if he actually arrived in a, in a nation filled with his descendants, but he never is there. Now, what's interesting is that whenever Paul talks about what it means to be a Christian in Galatians and Romans, he's continually referring not to Moses and not to David, but to Abraham. When Paul got into this controversy, when he began to win Greeks and Romans to Christ, and the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem said, well, now that they're Christians, they need to be culturally Jewish. They need to wear Jewish things and eat Jewish things, and they need to be culturally Jewish. And Paul said, no, 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 no. They are changed. They're Christian Greeks. They're Christian Romans. But they're Christian Greeks, and they're Christian Romans. And what it means to hear the call of God is very uncomfortable. And this is the way Miroslav Volf puts it in summarizing what Abraham means. He says, the courage to break his cultural and familial ties and abandon the gods of his ancestors out of allegiance to a god of all families and all cultures was the original Abrahamic revolution. In the same way, Christians depart from their original culture. Christians can never first of all be Asians or Americans or Russians or Tutsis. And then Christians. Christians are Christians first. Christians take a distance from the gods of their own culture and be because they give their ultimate allegiance to the gods of all cultures, to the God of all cultures and his promised future. But now in Christ, departure is no longer a spatial category. It takes place within the cultural space one inhabits. It involves neither a modern attempt to build a new heaven out of the world, nor a postmodern restlessness that fears to arrive anywhere. When Christians respond to the call of the gospel, they put one foot outside their culture while the other remains firmly planted in it. Christians' distance is not flight from one's original culture, but a new way of living within it because of the new vision of peace and joy they have in Christ. See, it is vastly easier to say, to leave your culture and say, I'm a Christian now, I want nothing to do with you. Or to stay in your culture and say, I'm this first, and Christianity is sort of a peripheral kind of hobby that helps me enrich my private life. No, no, no. Here's what's so bad, and here's what's so great. The call of God makes you a cultural pilgrim. It says, stay with your people, and, but be a Christian member of that old society, which means it's very hard work. It's very hard work. It's exciting work. Like Abraham, you depart, but you don't arrive. You've been pulled out somewhat of your, your home culture, you know? I mean, what if, you're, what if you're a wasp, huh? What if you're a northeastern wasp? Thin thighs, blonde hair, you know, okay, headband, all right? You went to boarding school, you went to Harvard and Yale. You're not just like the rest of them. You're a Christian, and yet, what are you supposed to do? Ditch the headband? If you ditch the headband, you're going to pick up somebody else's cultural thing. You're African American, you're Asian, you're Latin American. When you're a Christian, you're a Christian first, and you're Latin American second. You're a Christian first, and you're Asian second. You're a Christian first, and you're African American second. But you're an Asian Christian. You're an Asian Christian, which means you have to be Abraham, one foot in your culture, yet a transformed Christian member of that culture. It'd be far easier to just get out of it or stay completely in it. But God says, get out. And yet, you don't arrive somewhere else. And therefore, the call of God is personally ra radical, volitionally radical, missiologically radical, and culturally radical. Now, let's end. Somebody's out there saying, but practically speaking, how in the world do you bring that into your life? Somebody's out there saying, I don't understand how in the world you could ever bring yourself, or okay, I don't understand how in the world I could bring myself to surrender like that to make that kind of commitment. And here's the answer. Abraham had all these promises, but there was one promise under all the promises. There was one promise key to every other one. He was going to be a nation, but first he had to have an offspring. Did you see that word? A son. 
He was going to have a land filled with his, a nation of his people, but first he had to have a son. He was going to have a great name. He was going to bless all the peoples of the earth, but first he had to have a son. Everything came to that. But Sarah was barren, and Abram was old. And that meant the son was going to be an act of miraculous grace. And here's what, you, here's what God says. Abram, you can't qualify yourself for this. You just have to live with faith in the son. You have to live with, out of faith in that, and if you just live as if I'm going to give you that, if you live on the basis of that, everything else will come true. Now, Isaac points us to the real son, and we're in the same position. Here's what I mean. Look at Jesus. He got out. He had a call. He was told, leave your father's house. We sing about it. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race, right? He left the ultimate father's house. He left the ultimate security. He had real security. And why did he do it? For us. He went out not knowing whither he went. He went into the abyss. You talk about homelessness, he was utterly homeless. You talk about fatherlessness, he was utterly fatherless. But why did he do it? He did it so that we, so we could pay the penalty for our sin. So he lost his father so we could get his father. So we could be brought into his family. And this is what Jesus is saying. It's very simple. If you realize that I answered the original and ultimate call away from security so that you could have the ultimate security of knowing you're adopted into the family and you're loved in me, then you'll be able to live the Abrahamic big life. You'll be able to move out into the world. You'll be able to critique your culture, yet not be afraid to stay in it. You'll be able to surrender your will. You'll be able to handle any opposition. That's the key. The son of promise. Do you see it? Do you, do you grasp it? I mean, in a sense, the key for Abraham is the key to us. If you say, I'll never be able to handle this call, you're forgetting something. There's somebody handled it for you. Somebody already heard the call in degrees and realms of depth beyond anything you're going to be asked to do. You may be asked to follow Christ, and your family thinks you're a nut, just like Abram's. But Jesus Christ, see, answered the call and lost his father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He lost, in other words, he went out for you, so now you can go out for him. He lost the ultimate security for you. Now you can certainly lose your little securities for him because you have the ultimate security in him. Let the call of God come into your life. Hear it, surrender to it, and it'll make you like him. It'll make you great. It'll qualify you. Think. Let us pray. Father, the Lord's Supper is a time for us to remember what your Son did. The Lord's Supper is a time for us to remember who your Son was. The Lord's Supper is a, a visual uh, acting out of the way in which he answered the call, the call away from security, the call away from his own home, the call away from his Father. And because he did that for us, we can do anything now for him. And we pray that you would teach us how to live the same big life. Teach us how to live for others. Teach us how to live for you. Teach us how to live for the people around us. Give us the same big life because we have uh, heard the call ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For more of this series and other resources from Timothy Keller and Redeemer Presbyterian Church, please visit www.gospelinlife.com.